College in Ohio, Dr. Stites pursued her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at Harvard under Nobel laureate Dr. James Watson, where she examined the test tube assembly of an RNA bacteriophage. She spent the next three years in postdoctoral studies at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, where she worked with Nobel laureates Drs. Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. While there, she determined the biochemical sequence of RNA to study how ribosomes know where to initiate protein synthesis on bacterial mRNAs. Dr. Stites then began her career at Yale University as a professor of molecular biophysics and biochemistry, where she dedicated her lab to the study of RNA structure and function. Among their many significant findings, the Stites lab described a group of cellular particles called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs, a breakthrough in understanding how RNA is spliced. Subsequently, her laboratory defined the structures and functions of other non-coding ribonucleoproteins, such as those that guide the modification of rRNAs, microRNAs, and several produced by transforming herpes viruses. Dr. Stites has received numerous honor, honors and awards, including the National Medal of Science, the RNA Society Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Lasker Koshland Special Achievement Award in Medical Science. Additionally, she has been awarded 19 honorary degrees from around the world. A brief question and answer session will follow this presentation, so please hold your questions until the end. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stites to STSU. saying how much fun I've been having being here today. I've talked to lots of interesting people about lots of interesting things, and I'm very grateful to Carly and the Graduate Student Association for having orchestrated all of this, and I look forward to your questions and to the other events that are gonna happen today. Can I be heard, or is that a problem? That's probably, oh, yeah, that's probably slightly better, okay. So, as you've heard, that's a little bit too loud. Um, I've been studying RNA for my entire career, and what I want to tell you about today is about, as the slide says, um, non-coding RNAs made by viruses. Um, so, over the last three or four decades, actually, uh, we've devoted a fraction of our effort to studying virus-encoded non-coding RNAs rather than host-encoded non-coding RNAs. And what we're doing is looking for functions. Why are viruses making these RNAs? What are they doing for the virus? And when you think about it, it sort of seems like maybe it should be easier to find a function for a viral non-coding RNA than for a host non-coding RNA. And it's so simply because a host non-coding RNA could be doing absolutely anything. Whereas if a non-coding RNA is made by a virus, you would think it would be just doing something specifically for the virus, like aiding in the viral life cycle, or perhaps helping defend the virus against the counteractions that the host makes against the viral infection. It's also true that since virus genomes are small, if part of that precious genetic material is going to be devoted to making a non-coding RNA, it ought to be doing something really, really important for the virus. So that said, it turns out finding functions for virus with viral non-coding RNAs is still very hard, but it is at least something that happens. Uh, and I should say at the end of this that another reason for studying viral non-coding viral RNAs or proteins or whatever is because studying viruses often sheds light on the host because the host and the virus are constantly exchanging genetic material over evolutionary time. So the next slide introduces you to the viruses whose non-coding RNAs we've been studying. Uh, these belong to the 
herpes virus family, and namely for the gamma herpes virus family. So this includes KSHV, uh, a virus called HVS that I'll tell you a bit more about in the second half of my talk, and epstein barr virus, EBV. These viruses all have large double-stranded GNA genomes, so they make on the order of about 100 proteins and a variety of non-coding RNAs. Um, they are lymphotropic viruses, they infect <coughs> B cells or T cells. They have two main phases, as it says here. They can go into the cell and just replicate, splice the cell, make lots more virus. Or they can go into a state called latency, where the DNA of the virus actually circularizes and just stays as an episome in the nucleus of the cell, makes very few viral proteins but it's basically waiting for something environmental to happen so that it can come out and productively make more virus. And one reason that it's interesting to study these viruses is that they're associated with many human and animal cancers. For instance, this one, which I'll talk about in the second part of my talk, um, herpes virus Samuri, when it infects squirrel monkeys, its natural host, it undergoes lytic replication. It doesn't cause any disease. It just makes lots of virus. But if you put it into New World monkeys, like marmosets, it goes into latencies, and it causes um, malignant T-cell leukemias and lymphomas. And nobody really understands why there's, why there's this difference. OK, so the next slide is somewhat of a daunting slide, but don't be too overwhelmed, which summarizes all the gamma herpes virus non-coding RNAs or their RNP forms, um, their protein-bound forms that we've been studying over the years. And when they were discovered, the virus they come from, and how we're doing on finding functions for them. Uh, and what you'll notice is that there's a variety of different sorts of functions that these non-coding RNAs are doing. But the number of question marks that remain over here also tells you it's hard to find functions. Uh, but particularly in about the last decade or so, our rate of success has sort of stepped up. And I think this is purely because technology has finally caught up. And nowadays, there are all these wonderful techniques that you can use to ask whether a viral RNA is associated with this protein or that structure inside the cell. And that helps immensely in terms of finding functions. So we've actually begun to get somewhere. I'm not going to try to tell you about everything in this chart. I'm going to tell you two stories. Uh, the first one is going to be about um, Kaposi's sarcomas virus. Um, nuclear RNA called PAN for polyadenylated nuclear RNA. And here I'm going to tell you about a little bit about the structure and what we, how far we've gotten on figuring out what the mechanism is by which it enables the virus to make its late proteins and therefore make new virus particles. And then I'm going to go on and tell you about uh, one of the non-coding RNAs made by this weird monkey virus um, which is one of these classic stories in virology where learning about what this viral non-coding RNA does has really led us into insights about what me might be going on inside the host cell with respect to microRNA populations and turnover. Okay, so let me, in the next slide, tell you what the conclusions of the first part of the talk are going to be. So, it says two herpes viral non-coding pan RNAs. So these are the same RNA from two highly related uh, herpes viruses, KSHV and RRV, as I'll tell you. We know they're functionally homologous. They can substitute for one another. But they don't associate with common chromatin foci. And this is important because one of the major assumptions in the field that may even have leaked over into general knowledge is that what long non-coding RNAs are supposed to do is sit on chromatin and regulate a bunch of genes. And what this part of our work showed was that even what was published in the literature probably isn't correct. People were probably looking at background. And it's sort of providing a cautionary note about the dangers of believing too much in sort of big data. 
especially if you don't do all the right controls. So I'll tell you about the negative results that we've gotten, what I think they mean, and then what we're doing to really get an answer to the problem. We don't have an answer as to what uh, these pan-RNAs do. Um, and this has been the work of Johanna Withers, who's a very, very talented postdoc in the lab. She's had input from Tamea Valerie, a graduate student who graduated a year or so ago, um, Eric Lee, an undergraduate, and Therese Yario, technician. So let me uh, go on and say a little bit more about KSHV as a virus. Um, it's actually prevalent in about 10% of us carry KSHV in a latent state. There are certain areas of the world where it's at much higher frequency. Uh, it's a causative agent, it's a Kaposi sarcoma, which is these horrible sort of cancerous red spots on the skin. And those arise in um, immunocompromised individuals, specifically like people with AIDS. Um, and interestingly, Kaposi sarcoma is the most common cancer in males and in children in Africa because of the high prevalence of HIV and then the co-infection that exists, and therefore it is really, really a growing health concern uh, worldwide. I think I've already told you these things, double-stranded DNA genome, about 100 protein coding genes, it makes a lot of several different kinds of non-coding RNAs, both short, very short ones and, and longer ones. Okay, so now let me introduce you to the pan-RNA, which is, ever since its discovery in 96, has been a very fascinating RNA. It turns out that this is the most abundant polyadenylated RNA in a vertically infected KSHV infected cell. It's only about one kb long. It's a regular Paul II transcript, so it has a five prime seven methyl G cap and a poly A tail that you see schematized here. Um, this, this shows the DAPI stain staining the DNA in the nucleus and, and in situ stain for pan RNA showing you that this RNA is in the nucleus. And we even know that it doesn't just shuttle up in and out of the nucleus and spend most of its time there, but it doesn't even seem to shuttle. Um, as I've mentioned several times, it's made higher and higher amounts throughout infection, the myelitic phase, late lytic phase, it's very, very abundant. And it's expressed at about a, uh, a level of about 500,000 copies per cell. And to put this number in perspective, this is incredibly abundant. Um, there are about a million copies of the splicing SNRPs needed for removing all the introns in a mammalian cell. So this is close to that. And that can also be compared to about 10 to the seventh ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So this is a really, really, really abundant RNA. It has to be doing something important. Um, and what the picture up here shows is what we discovered, um, gosh, nearly 10 years ago, is that the reason that this RNA can accumulate to such high amounts is that it has in it an element and that's this thing over here called an E and E um, element for nuclear expression. And what that element does is it forms a triple helical structure here with these, these immediate internal loops with the poly A tail and sort of clamps onto the poly A tail. And since most RNA degradation starts by removing the poly A tail and then chewing up the rest of the RNA, this then stabilizes the RNA against it. And we saw um, with Tom Stites' lab a crystal structure of what that looks like. And what we see is that you form lots of crit base pairs and then hoop seam pairs to form triples. And this is what the structure looks like. And then some additional A minor interactions that aren't that relevant for this particular functional talk. As I indicated at the beginning, um, it turns out that in closely related viruses, and here are a whole bunch of them, um, that they also have pan-RNA, but they're very con poorly conserved in terms of sequence, very low sequence conservation. There's a little bit of conservation here in the promoter region and a little bit in 
the signal for adding the poly A tail, but the rest of it is very poorly conserved. And yet, when you look at these RNAs in the region of their E and E, the special stabilizing structure, you see that even though the sequence isn't conserved, the structure is conserved. And we believe that in all these other cases, that poly A tail is actually being grabbed and clamped and therefore pre preventing the degradation of these RNAs. Uh, so we have here um, KSHV, the human virus, RRV that I'll be talking about, rhesus rhabdovirus, uh, more, here's a couple of horse virus, equine herpes virus, a bat herpes virus, etc. And even in these, you can see that this motif is upside down, but that just means it grabs the poly A tail in the opposite direction, but the overall effect of clamping it and keeping away nuclease is, is, is the same in that they're stabilizing. Okay, so what do we know about the function of pan-RNA um, that I had briefly summarized in the chart at the beginning? Um, we know that it's required for late viral gene expression and for the production of progeny virions because late in the viral life cycle, what's being made are all the structural proteins that go into the actual virus particle. And this was actually figured out by Sumit Bora, who was a graduate student in my lab, um, this was about a decade, not quite a decade ago. And what he did was to uh, look at, uh, this is just a Western blot where he's looking at an early protein, immediate early protein, several early genes, and then several late genes of the virus and using oligonucleotides. So if you make complementary oligonucleotides to an RNA uh, made of DNA, put them inside a cell, there's an enzyme called RNase H that cleaves the RNA strand of the RNA-DNA duplex that you've produced and will therefore lower the level of the RNA that you've targeted. And so by after targeting the pan-RNA with several oligos and bringing it down to about the 10 level, you can then look to see what goes wrong with protein synthesis. And what you see is that the early gene, and, or the immediate early gene, the early genes are infected, but these two late protein genes at the end of infection are made not at the normal level. So that's, that's what's going on. Um, another thing to look at is what about the DNA replication of the virus? And what is shown down here is that the intracellular DNA replication is at a normal level. So that's not being interfered with. But if you then look at the DNA that's released into the medium as virus particles, you can see that that goes way down in the amount of RNA. And it's almost right at the level of adding gancyclovir, which is a specific inhibitor of herpes viral DNA replication. So it's as you expect that if you don't make the late proteins, you can still replicate the, the DNA inside the cell, but it never gets packaged, it never gets put out as new viruses. So since I've already mentioned that we wanted to um, try to take advantage of the fact that there are panhomologs and closely related viruses, we needed to do the same as sort of experiments for this monkey virus, rhesus rhabdovirus and ask when we knock down pan-RNA, see here it's going down to about 10%. Look at intracellular viral DNA, that's just fine, just like with KSHV, but when you look at the extracellular viral DNA encapsulated, released into the, into the medium, you can see that that's down. So the, the end function of these two pan-RNAs seems to be the same, but mechanistically, how are they actually doing it? Um, and to go further and sort of put a nail in the coffin uh, about these two RNAs being functional homologs, uh, Tanea and Johanna did some very elegant experiments with BACMITs that had been made in other labs that were available to us where the pan or part of the pan RNA in KSHV had been knocked out and the whole pan RNA in RRV had been knocked out. And what they were able to then do was infect cells with these backlinks lacking the pan gene, pan RNA gene, and ask can the pan RNA from the other virus substitute and recover 
for the release of virus into the cytoplasm. And those are the experiments that are shown down here. Here are a bunch of controls, the level of expression that we got of the two different RNAs. And what you see here for the KSHV, you could either put in the KSHV pan-RNA or the RRD pan-RNA and see uh, a good amount of the encapsulated virus released into the supernatant. And likewise, in the experiment with the RRD delta pan back, then, you can see that you have nice recovery with both RNAs. So we feel that we pretty much show that these two RNAs are functional homologues and substitute for one another. So how they're doing it then mechanistically, you would think, would also be the same. Um, and that's the question that's risen, that um, is raised in this particular slide. How does it do it? And here, as I mentioned at, near the very beginning, it turns out that a lot of other people had been working on this problem, trying to figure out what pan-RNA was doing. And there are a bunch of publications of what people thought the mechanism would be. Um, I want to particularly point out this mechanism, this mechanism, and this mechanism, all of which involve pan-RNA interacting with the DNA, either to um, change the modification state of chromatin or interact with other factors in order to affect gene expression from the viral genome, and this one which has to do with whether or not a, a, an important late, um, a latent protein can get onto the chromosome. And there was even a publication in 2012 from the PARI lab where they used chirp analysis, which basically localizes, or is supposed to localize, where an RNA can sit on DNA, namely on chromatin. And they had found that there were 35 different viral promoters that pan RNA seemed to sit on, and a couple of host promoters, and had advocated the idea that pan RNA would be acting like not long non-coding RNAs are supposed to act by regulating the output of chromatin. But having two viruses with two pan-RNAs that were interchangeable, what we reasoned was that it was worth going back and redoing the experiment of asking where these RNAs sit on chromatin, is it really at the same sites on the viral or on the host chromatin? And we used a slightly different method than what had been published called capture hybridization analysis of RNA targets because it was devised by a, an assistant professor in our department who did this as a, as a postdoc. Um, but the idea here is the experiment's very much like a chip experiment. I'm hoping that everybody knows what a chromatin IP immune precipitation experiment is, where you want to ask where a protein's sitting on chromatin, so you have antibodies against the chromatin, you cross-link, you degrade the DNA, and then you pull out with the antibodies the part of the DNA that's associated with that particular protein and sequence it. Uh, this does the same thing for RNA. So the idea is if you have an RNA sitting at particular loci of chromatin, you likewise do formaldehyde cross-linking, you fragment the DNA, and then in this procedure you go in with an oligonucleotide that's complementary to your non-coding RNA, that's been linked to beads by biotin, and pull out uh, the specific fragments that the antibody, or sorry, that are recognized by the complementary oligonucleotide attached to beads uh, and sequence the DNA, and in that way you get where the RNA was sitting on the chromatin. And in order to increase stringency, what Johanna and Tanea did was to assess two homologs, namely the pan-RNA from KSHV and the pan-RNA from RRD, hoping that there would at least be substantial overlap. Uh, they also looked at the association over time, since we know that the amount of pan-RNA goes up during the lytic course of infection, there obviously should be more sitting on the relevant sites later on than there is at early times. And technically, they use two, two different sets of oligos for pulling out uh, the pan RNA. And the results that they got was really quite a surprise. So, in the experiment that they did, it's just we use three biological replicas with all sorts of repeats. Um, they got over a thousand peaks 
for the KSHV pan RNA, over 200 feet for the RRB uh, pan RNA. Here they are plotted along the human chromosome. Um, there's not much on the X and the Y, um, but there are a lot of peaks a lot of other places. Uh, there were none perceptible ones sitting on the viral genome as had been predicted by the previous literature. And when you look at all these ones, there were only two that overlapped, and neither of those were at a promoter or any other known regulatory region. Uh, so we think, sadly, what had gone on in the previous literature was that people were basically plotting background. Because when you do a well-controlled experiment in this way, you don't get anything that really looks significant. And then our undergraduate went ahead and just asked a very simple question. If I just fractionate the nucleus into chromatin and nucleoplasmic compartments, and here are the controls, do I see pan-RNA sitting on the chromatin? And the answer basically is no. And here's some controls showing the fractionation, in fact, work in terms of spliced RNAs. OK, so um, we don't think that pan does its job by sitting on the chromatin. What could it be doing? We obviously wanted to check. If you're not making late proteins, it might be that your late messenger RNAs are either not being made or are being degraded. So the next slide I'm going to show you shows, um, again, knocking down uh, KSHB pan RNA with various oligonucleotides and looking at the levels of various ones of the early and the late uh, viral RNAs. This shows that the pan RNA is knocked down and this overlapping protein message is also knocked down. But the levels of late mRNA don't seem to be um, affected that much. And this is some more controls going back to the DNA and showing that we actually have a situation where in this experiment we were making uh, virus particles to be put out into the cytoplasm. Okay, so where does that leave us? We have late viral messenger RNAs, uh, but we don't have the proteins being made. So what could be happening? And that's sort of the questions are raised in this slide. It could be that the mRNA isn't available to ribosomes to make it. It could go all the way to the nucleus. Uh, it could be that the level of protein synthesis is reduced or that protein degradation is enhanced. This we checked out. I won't show you the data, but it didn't appear that there were any differences in the level of late protein uh, decay, in decay rates of late proteins with or without pan RNA. Um, what we did look at, uh, this is hard, so we we're saving that for last, but what we did look at was to see whether there is where the late messenger RNA is inside cells. And here for a change, I'm going to show you a positive result instead of a negative result, which concludes that the late viral messages are more kept in the nucleus. In other words, something seems to be going wrong with their nuclear export, so they don't get out to the ribosome, so you can make late proteins. And here's what's being looked at is the colored bars are all the controls, and the gray bars are all where pan RNA has been knocked down. And you see the gray bars are always lower than the colored bars, um, except in this particular cluster. So it turns out that even early viral transcripts don't get out as well. Late viral transcripts don't. Post transcripts don't, except for those post transcripts that are exported from the nucleus, not by the canonical mRNA export pathway. Uh, the RNAs that are being looked at here, 5 rna uh, the signal recognition protocol RNAs, which don't have names, are all known to be exported by different pathways. And those, those don't seem to be affected too much. The gray bars and the purple bar. Whereas all these others are being affected. So um, that's basically the end of the data I have to show you on this. That's where we are on this problem. Um, so what we want to know at this point is how does pan RNA affect nuclear mRNA export? And I've just got a couple of slides that show you um, the approach that we're taking to this problem at this point. Um, 
one thing that our wonderful undergraduate era has done is to make a whole bunch of notations, deletion notations, short ones, about 15 to 25 long, in the pan on a day, all over the web. And with these, you want to go back and check, can they actually explain it? Uh, <coughs> nail down the region of the pan RNA that's important, and then we can look for proteins that are binding to it, etc. Uh, but this shows that, in fact, all of these RNAs are in the nucleus, so they're at least where they're supposed to be, so we can go ahead with this type of experiment. Uh, so that's one approach we're taking. The other approach is to capitalize on something that was found by another lab, Britt Glounsinger's lab at Berkeley, has found that late in KSHB infection, all sorts of RNA binding proteins that are normally in the cytoplasm are translocated to the nucleus. And so one possibility is that that messes things up in the nucleus and that somehow the pan RNA by being there in such high amounts precludes that and that's a possibility we're looking into. We know for instance that pad C, this is poly A binding protein C, um, which is the most abundant protein that coats the poly A tails of messages in the cytoplasm. We know that that is transported to the nucleus during KSHB infection, and that could be a primary one in terms of messing up what's going on. So let me just finish this part of the talk um, by telling you the conclusion so far and the future directions. The conclusions are down here. Um, Pan-RNAs are functionally interchangeable, at least between the two viruses that we've looked at, but they're unlikely to act by binding poster viral chromatin. Uh, Pan-RNA does not influence, I didn't talk about this, but those were more negative results, mRNA stability, protein decay, um, and it does associate with the localized poly A binding protein in the nucleus and somehow influence mRNA export, and that's what we've got to figure out, um, is the, how, how this whole thing works, and we're doing numerous things to try to get there. Okay, so at this point, let me go on to the next topic that I want to talk to you about with a completely different virus and a completely different non-coding RNA, and mostly due to the work of, of Paulina and the predecessor in the lab, Damien Kazala, um, Pauline is a postdoc. Um, we look into a little known phenomenon whereby, depending upon the target RNA that a microRNA is, is trying to interact with, what ends up happening is instead of the target getting degraded, which is mostly what we think about with microRNAs, the microRNA is actually degraded. And that phenomenon is called target-directed microRNA decay, TDMD. In addition to Pauline and undergraduate, Sonia Wong has worked on this, Therese and Trusiario. Um, and we've had an incredibly fruitful collaboration with Ian McRae's lab. He's at Scripps. He's a structural biologist, does x-ray structures, particularly the AGO protein that interacts with microRNAs. And his um, graduate student, now she's graduated, gone on to a postdoc, just with Daria. So let me start out by here by reminding you of uh, what we know about microRNAs and the AGO protein and how all this works. I'm sure you all know that our cells, mammalian cells, <coughs> lots and lots of little RNAs that are about 21, 22 millimeters long are called microRNAs. And what their job seems to be to do is to regulate the expression of messenger RNAs that they target by having partial complementarity. So, you know, the five prime amino acid, three prime amino acid, the five prime anti micro RNA, they have what's called a seed sequence where nucleotides two to, two to seven usually show almost perfect complementarity to the target. And then there's variable amounts of complementarity to the rest of the 21 nucleotide sequence. And the interaction between a microRNA and its target, and I should say about 50% of our messenger RNAs are known to be targeted by microRNAs. MicroRNAs are therefore you know, involved in all sorts of things, development, differentiation, disease. Um, 
But what the, this protein, ego, is very important because it binds a microRNA and helps it interact with the complementary site on messenger RNAs. And then it recruits other proteins, like it recruits it called PWE182, various others. And together, what then happens is that the RNA gets deadylated and degraded, so that its level goes down, or there are direct effects on translation that are still poorly understood. So microRNAs downregulate messenger RNA output with the help of the ABO protein. The other thing that you all know about, I'm sure, that uh, the system does, and this is a state that's usually engineered by a scientist, is if you make a 21 nucleotide RNA that's perfectly complementary to an mRNA that you want to get rid of in your cells, that's called an siRNA or silencing RNA, then what happens is that AGO2, we have four AGOs in our cells, AGO1 through four, AGO2 has the property of being able to have it, well, it has an active site that then can cut the target RNA about in the middle of where the microRNA is binding, and therefore it cleaves the RNA and destroys the RNA, silences the RNA. But it turns out that there's this third function of ego protein that, as I just said, is much less well understood, where if the complementarity between the microRNA and the messenger RNA, or this could be a non-coding, long non-coding RNA, is different, then instead of the target getting degraded, getting cleaved and degraded, it turns out that the level of the microRNA goes down. This is not done by ego getting confused and cleaving the microRNA instead of cleaving the target. It's done, and it's been known for some time, by the microRNA undergoing a decay process whereby it's through front end, gets things added onto it, that serves as a handle, it gets grabbed onto decay machinery, and then the microRNA gets degraded. And this is a phenomenon that I want to tell you about. That's target-directed uh, microRNA direct dead degradation. So this was first described in 2010, both by Phil Zamor's group at UMass, um, where they were looking at this phenomenon happening in Drosophila, and by Damian Casala, who was a former postdoc in my lab, who was studying the ability of the non-coding RNAs made by one of our herpes viruses, herpes virus summary, um, to degrade a particular host microRNA. Uh, this microRNA is called MIR27. It's particularly important in T cell activation. And since this virus infects T cells and wants those cells to be activated, it was important for it to manipulate the level of the host microRNA that's involved in regulating um, T cell activation. So let me, in the next slide, just summarize for you what Damien primarily had shown in 2010. So it turns out that herpes virus summary makes actually seven small nuclear RNAs that we call SIRS for herpes summary U RNAs. This is a picture of SIR1. Um, these RNA molecules look just like the RNAs in the splicing snarks. They have trinomal caps at the 5' end. They have SM binding sites, this conserved set of proteins that binds to these snarks. But instead of this non-coding RNA made by a virus to having something to do with splicing, which looks exactly like what should be happening, what Damien discovered was that this RNA binds to host near 27, this microRNA that's important for T cell activation. And in doing so, decreases its level. And that's shown over here in this experiment where uh, into B cells was introduced the, an empty vector or wild type SIR1. And you see the level of near 27 going down to about 10%. Whereas a control microRNA, uh, you don't see any change in the level. And they did an experiment show it was due to the fact that a complementarity between uh, SIR1, the RNA here, and the microRNA. Okay, um, Damien then went off, he has a 
assistant professor position, I think it's now associate professor position, at uh, the University of Utah, and he's been um, studying with some success what the other SIRs do, SIR 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, but when Paulina then later came to the lab, what she wanted to do was really figure out what was going on in the interaction between these two RNAs that was causing MIR-27 to decay. And so what I'm going to tell you next is that what the sequence requirements are, she did a lot of mutagenesis. Our collaboration with Ian McRae's group, what do the structures reveal about how this actually works? And finally, uh, what modifications uh, are, are needed? This is what we're still working on in order to get this phenomenon to happen. So let me start out with some of Paulina's data. She made hundreds of mutants. I'm only showing you just a very few of them here. Um, this is the same diagram that I showed you before, where MIR-27 is complementary to SIR-1. And that's diagrammed over here. The green are the complementary features, and the red here are the non-complementary features. And I just want to point out a few things on this plot. So if that's the level of MIR-27 normally, as I told you and showed you before, if you put in wild type SIR1, the level goes down to about 10%. If you now change the part of the microRNA, or sorry, change the part of the SIR that would be interacting with the seed sequence in the microRNA, this part, then you see that uh, the decay of the microRNA. If you took in the change of the same part by and the maintaining of the seed sequence and combining the data today, if you now eliminate this bulge here, so this nucleotide don't match in the middle, also that's required in order to get decay. If you plot, if you move the sum of the bulge, three nucleotides away, that seems rather far, but that still seems to work because you have decay. Or if you even reduce the size of the bulge to two nucleotides, here in this region, then that's enough to, to actually work. So those are the, the basic conclusions, and they're summarized over here. So you need to have complementary parity with the microRNA in the seed region. You need to have a bulge of at least two nucleotides, but you can move it around a bit. And at the three prime end, you need to have more extensive complementarity. Uh, between seven and ten nucleotides. Now, what I didn't show you or didn't point out in the last slide was this very last lane over here, where now there doesn't seem to be that much decay, but the length of the microRNA has gotten a lot longer. Uh, near, 20, near 27 is about 20 nucleotides long, so this is 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, um, and you see a fair amount of it. So what's going on there? And that was happening with some of the mutations that she made in SIR1 and put into cells. Um, one thing that, since this is going on at the three prime end, we had other reasons to believe that. Paulina made a lot of mutations in SIR1 that would be complementary to the microRNA here and asked if those made any difference. And although she put in quite different mutations in that region, doesn't really make any difference. You still accumulate this longer product. So the question is, what's the longer product doing? Is it still an active microRNA? Is it retained on the ego protein, et cetera? Um, there we go. Um, we have antibodies, so we could show that the longer product was indeed immunoprecipitated with anti-ego antibodies, so it's still sitting on ego, so it could potentially be active. It also is still associated with SIR1, so we think a tertiary complex is forming. And I won't go into the details here, but what, what this experiment with um, um, synthetic reporter told us was that even though it was there on ego, it didn't seem to be active in acting like a microRNA, knocking down uh, the product of the messenger RNA. So, I want to go on at this point to um, talk a little bit because it's very revealing about what the actual 
x-ray structures reveal about what's going on with this new phenomenon. And again, that's work from Ian McRae's lab. So I'd like to start out with just showing you what his lab had published several years ago, where they had taken human AGO2 protein, this is it here in two different views, bound to a microRNA. And what you see is that the five prime end of the microRNA associates with sort of one half of the protein uh, that then spreads through a channel uh, and ends up, the three prime ends up in a, in a pocket. Was, you'll see a lot more of that in the PAS domain at the other end. The McRae lab had also done a structure of, this is a different microRNA, this is near 22, um, bound to a target. So this would be the, a little piece of the target messenger RNA or PDMD RNA. And there you can see this interaction. You can see the seed interaction there. Again, you lose density, meaning it's disordered for the microRNA, but you see it coming up on the other half of the protein in the three prime end in the pocket. But now the question is what happens if you now have the TDMD conformation where you have this bulge in the middle and an extended three prime end complement there? This is again a synthetic RNA that they made. Um, you see the seed interaction, you see the interruption. Here I think you can see that the protein is sort of expanded in that direction by these particular interactions with the RNA. And the effect of that is that the three prime end has come out of its protective binding pocket in the PAS domain and is now sort of out there available interacting with the target. And of course, they also did the structure of SIR1 complex with NIR27. And there it turns out that we don't see this helix, which we have a lot of other evidence forms, but that it's relatively disordered. So you don't see it. What you see is the seed interaction uh, with the SIR1. But definitely, you don't see the three prime end in the pocket. So I already said to you that what was known from lots of work in the field was that what happens under these conditions is microRNA gets nucleotides added onto its three prime end, which we saw evidence of, and then it gets grabbed up by the decay machinery and decayed. And what McRae's lab did then was to uh, do some model building to ask whether in the structure that they had where they could see the three prime end being pulled out of the pocket, could they in fact uh, model build an interaction with other proteins that we would think might be involved in what's happening at the three prime end, type four adds new residues and a residues to the three prime end prime is a nuclear exonuclease that would be chewing on the three prime end and see whether the three prime end would go into the active site of these enzymes and so that one could act, this would be logical to be going on. And that's the conclusion of their model building. But I just want to make one final experimental point here, which is that if we thought, which we did at that point, that pulling the three prime end out of its special binding pocket in the PAS domain is really what the whole setup is aimed to do, then you might also think that by making mutations in the uh, ego protein right in that binding pocket so that you don't have a good interaction might have the same effect as having a target RNA there that's designed. And that's what's shown in this slide. Okay, so normally there's a phenylalanine that sits right on top of the new three prime terminal residue in the microRNA in the pocket. So um, Paulina and uh, Sonia, the undergraduate, change this phenylalanine to an alanine and then ask what happens to the profile of microRNAs. And what you see is many more both longer and shorter products just by changing the AGO protein and not even changing this. And likewise, um, what's interesting is even with a non-targeted RNA near 20, changing the binding site in the AGO protein is enough to give you these extensions and shorter products, which are being used. So finally, let me just, the very few final slides. Um, 
talk about the sequence requirements or so go on to um, what the modifications are that are associated with what happens to the microRNA during this PEMD process. And of course, we've sequenced uh, a microRNA near 27 undergoing TEMD and looked at what's going on at its 3' end. And what you see is that there are A's and U's added, so the mixture in the various positions as it gets longer and longer. They're clearly not templated by what's in the genome, so they're not processing product. Um, there's something that's added on. And this then means that there are a lot of possibilities for what enzymes might be involved. It turns out that there's just a whole families of what are called tutties, as people used to think they, they were specific for adding U's, but many of them add A's, the three primates of all sorts of RNAs. Um, there are just all sorts of possibilities for enzymes that might be involved in this process. Paulina has tried to knock these down using siRNAs. That's not very successful. She can only get them down, the various ones down, by to about 40%. And if you then look at whether you accumulate uh, longer, more stable uh, microRNAs after you've knocked down these, these um, adding enzymes, you don't see very much of an effect. So we've sort of take, we're taking other tactics to really understand what's going on during the process. And these are the things that Paulina is doing now. We have evidence that in the target, there may be other sequences nearby that would direct um, this whole process to the microRNA that's undergoing degradation. Uh, there's also a new uh, procedure where you can actually get half-lives of RNAs by doing pulse labeling with S35 or with IOU. Um, and we're using that to try to see about the relative half-lives of these various intermediates that we see, and of course using uh, CRISPR to knock out the nucleotidal transferases. But let me just finish by then summarizing what I've told you in this part of the talk, that in order to get this target-directed microRNA decay, the base pairing requirements are certainly flexible, but there's certain themes, and as I just mentioned, we also think that there are additional, perhaps, protein binding sites in the target that are necessary. And what then happens structurally is that the 3 end gets pulled out of the protective domain that it's normally in on the ego protein, making it susceptible to enzymatic attack, both things that are adding to the 3 end and chewing at the 3 end. Uh, these particular enzymes could be important in adding use to the 3' and making them targets for decay. But the most interesting thing is if you think about what's going on, even in an unprotected cell, every microRNA has all these different targets. And if some of these targets are set up so that they're carrying out TDMD instead of the microRNA controlling the messenger, and that whole population of messenger RNAs, non-coding RNAs in the cell, is combining to control microRNA populations. And we know very little about what controls microRNA today. So this is important in terms of thinking about, you know, this whole, whole big regulatory network involving microRNAs. So let me like just to show you pictures of the people whose work I've been telling you about. Uh, this is Johanna, who's been the primary mover on the pan-RNA story, and Eric Lee, our undergraduate. Uh, this is Paulina, who's done the TDMD work, and Sonia Wang, the undergraduate who worked with her. And this is Ian McRae and Jessica Daddario from the Scripps Institute. And lots of funding sources and lots of colleagues uh, that I'm very, very grateful to. And I'm very grateful to all of you who stayed to the end of this, and I hope you might have questions. Thank you. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, how important is that uh, uh, ENE element? Can you actually simply convert maybe another RNA in the 
like acting like a pan by just putting that in the element? That's a great question. So my pet hypothesis was that you could take any old RNA that had a poly A tail and an E and E element to stabilize it and it would work. Johanna did that experiment about four or five months ago and it turns out no, it did not work. So there have to be other things going on, even though we can't see any sequence homology between these RNAs in terms of what they're binding or how they're binding it, that the virus has evolved. I mean, you know, maybe, I, I really love this idea take any old RNA and it would work. But if you think about it, you know, if these things have evolved over millions of years in order to carry out this particular function for the virus, probably any old sequence wouldn't work. But we have to have some other things in the sequence. And I suspect it has to do with protein binding, but we don't know yet. But that's a great question because it was my favorite question. Thank you. Probably would be. I think not many of those sequences are available. Herpes virus Achilles is another one in this group. That is a virus that does normally affect, infect human cells. It has a SIR1 that has actually does have in the region that binds to MIR27 and is responsible for the TDMD if it is conserved. So I think it's general, but because there aren't that many different viral sequences available. Uh, we haven't done that, but that's a good idea. We should do that. Thank you. Well, good then, suggestion. And a follow-up question, or I, I guess a different one, is how about in our cells that are not infected, do we have something equivalent to these Yeah, centers? okay. I did short shrift on the literature during the last three to four years. There have been at least three other reports of long non-coding RNAs uh, in our cells, uninfected, that do it, as well as reports like um, the CMV virus has in its, in an intergenic region on a bisostronic message, it has one of these sequences that again degrades MIR27 because these viruses really, you know, want to target MIR27. But there are several reported instances now of RNAs in us, big long non-coding RNAs that serve as these targets for a particular microRNA. So it's it's not all fantasy. The whole picture is fantasy, but the the bits and pieces are there, and I think it's going to turn out to be a very important phenomenon. Thank you. I have a question over here. Sure. With regard to your pan RNAs. Yeah. First part of the story. Do it. Do any of those RNAs have catalytic activity? In other words, are they ribozymes? We haven't really looked because you have to be suspicious of what you're looking for. I mean, they don't seem to be self-cleaving ribozymes. I mean, they're stable under all conditions where we worked with them over a period of too many years, a couple decades, uh, but. That's, a, that's another idea, is they could have some sort of catalytic activity that could be important. If you have an idea as to what to look for, let me know and we'll, we'll try to assay it. Gosh, great questions for a non-RNA audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, and thank you, Joan, for such an interesting, wonderful talk. Everybody give a round of applause. For